Well, I'm excited as we continue on in this series, being more than survivors. It's not an easy thing in this world that we live in sometimes, but I know God can help us, and we're certainly going to learn uh, through His Word today. Folks, would you pray with me as we go into this time of God's Word together? Lord, thank you so much again for this day, and thank you for the privilege uh, for so many reasons of being here in your house today, and, and thank you for your presence, not only here, but in our lives each and every day. But help us to learn from Paul today. So many times we get, we just get it kind of down with how this world is going and how things are happening around us, but help us, Lord God, not to take the world's approach, but help us to take Paul's approach to find common ground, to talk to people about you and about our faith, and to just be positive in a world that so wants to be negative all the time. Lord, thank you for this opportunity we have to learn more about that. We pray your blessings on it. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, there's an old saying that I used to hear when I was a kid, and I'll bet you anything you can finish this old saying. If I start it, you can finish it, okay? So here's what my mom, still the voice in my head, used to tell me. She used to say, Ram, if you can't say anything nice, you guys have heard that before, haven't you? Isn't that something? And there's my mom, and it usually was me out of five kids that she was saying that to, but uh, she's been gone for many years, but she is still the voice in my head. And I believe this, this homey proverb that she used to use that I, we just said together I believe it points to a biblical truth about thriving spiritually in a world that's all too quick to put people down and, and to be negative. Folks, I want to tell you this as I begin today. If we're going to be more than survivors in a world that desperately needs to hear a word about a living God who loves them, then we're going to have to find a way to do that in the midst of a culture that's not always positive. So we're going to have to be the positive force in that with God's help and uh, find ways to speak to our culture about the, the positive side of our faith. A few years ago, I had a chance to attend a small conference over in Green Lake. Some of you know where Green Lake is, just north of here a little bit, northwest of here. Uh, but there was a gentleman that was in town that uh, I had been a follower of for years, and his name is Len Sweet. And Len Sweet is a pastor, he's a professor, a seminary professor, and so forth. And what he came in to talk to us about was, was the importance of connecting our faith to the culture that we live in and how to go about that. And then he used this example, and uh, he said this. He said, you know, what if I were, were a missionary to China? And, and this was years and years ago before there was too, mission, too many missionaries to China. But he said, what if I was a missionary to China? And he said, I went there, and, and my goal was to share the love of God with these people and he said, uh, I had a contact there, a major contact, and so when I arrived in China, I met with that contact, and the conversation went something like this. He says, what if I started out this way? He said, uh, you know, you guys talk funny here. You guys talk funny. Or your food stinks. I really can't stand your food. Or things like this. Your clothes are hideous. But in spite of all that, I'm here to share the love of God with you. How do you think that would go over? You think that's a good missionary strategy? Folks, I'm going to give it an absolute no today. That is not a good, and he gave that as a negative example, of course. But, but all too often, that's exactly how we approach people. We want to share, man, you know, God has done some good things in my life. I'd like to share it with you. But we begin to approach it in a negative way. I think instead of doing that, we need to take our cues from the Apostle Paul, who's going to be our Bible teacher for today. And we read about him going to the city of Athens, Greece. There was no more pagan place in, in his day that was not Christian or not of God than this place called Athens. And so he goes there in Acts chapter 17, we hear about him getting to speak, having an opportunity, and how he went about that in Athens. And so please follow along with me, if you would, on the screen as we share in this scripture, but here's where it starts, uh, Acts chapter uh, 17 and verse 16. While Paul was waiting, and that is so important right there, just those first few words, I'll get back to that. But while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers 
When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? And others said, well, he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. Verse 19, then they took him to the high council of the city. We would call that city council. That's what we would call that. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what that's all about. It should be explained, verse 2, that all the Athenians as well as the foreigners in Athens seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. Apparently, they were independently wealthy, and that's all they had to do all day. So that's, that's what they did. So Paul, standing before the council, the city council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I noticed that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This is the God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him, we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, here he is connecting with the culture again, As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead." When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt. But others said, we want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them, with the city council. But some joined him and became believers. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the council, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So that was Paul's day on Mars Hill, talking to the city council of Athens. Folks, you've got a short outline there in your bulletin of the message, and you can, if you're a fill-in-the-blank kind of person, you can do that, but at least you'll know kind of where I'm at. But I just have a few short things I want to share with you today, and the first is this, that those who are more than survivors reference the culture to share God's love. We have to find some common ground to speak to our culture in positive ways about the faith that we claim. And Paul, and I said these were some of the most important words of the scripture, while he was waiting for his companions, God used that waiting time um, to show him how he could connect with this culture and how he could share this very important good news. He didn't start out negative so as to put them down. Too many were probably doing that, trying to get their point across already. Instead, he chose a positive way. He wanted to break down some walls and begin to build bridges to this Athenian culture. And that's exactly what Paul did. And uh, uh, Paul would recommend to us this very positive way of connecting with people too. Again, some of the most important words of this scripture were those first words that said this, while Paul was waiting in Athens. How many of you have ever complained that you had to wait somewhere? Anybody here? Nobody besides me? I see a lot of heads nodding. Okay, thank you for that. Most of us in the Western world, we don't like waiting. That's one of the things we just despise. And we wait at a lot of different places, don't we? We get tired of waiting in checkout lines. And and I think my wife is here somewhere, but uh, every time she comes home from Walmart, I hear about it. Waiting in line or whatever. But but most of us don't like to do that. Or, Or at the service center, waiting for an oil change. Sometimes that takes longer. Here's one that gets me. When I have to go to the DMV and get my license updated. Oh, man, it's like going to Disney World, isn't it? You go through these lines, and you just wait and wait and wait. Or the doctor's office, or dentist's office, or or if you're students here today, you'll remember this probably, or know that this is true. Uh, Waiting in line at the financial aid office to turn in some paperwork, 
only to find out that you don't have the right paperwork and you have to go back and get that and then get in line again. We don't like those kind of, those times of waiting, do we? But folks, what I'm telling you today is, is Paul used that time or God used Paul through that time to really connect with the culture that he was in. And I believe while we're waiting, if we ever have to do that, just a quick prayer. God, use this time. Use this time for your purposes. Use this time in a positive way. Because quite frankly, many of us can't see positives in the waiting line. We just can't. But if we pray and ask God to help show us that, um, that's what we need to do. And that's what Paul was doing. He was using this time for God's glory. I believe he would tell us this, just a few short things. First one is be attentive. You have to be attentive while you're waiting. If God places you and allows you to be in a place where you end up waiting for a while, be attentive. Look around you. Find out what's going on to connect with the people who are there. Verse 16 says again, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his friends, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. Do you remember Len Sweet's example of the missionary to China? That, that's a bad example, isn't it? If I didn't say that before, I'm just going to tell you, that's a bad example of how to share the love of God with people. What Paul did was he looked for something culturally that he could connect with them on in a positive way. And so he found this statue. They had all these idols all around, but he found this statue that said to an unknown God. He complimented them for their religious fervor, didn't he? That's what he found to be positive about. He wasn't real excited about it, but that's what he found to approach them about. He was, and then he said to that unknown God, he goes, let me tell you about that one. So brilliantly, he connected those two things. And I'm sure there are different ideas, folks, on where to begin when dealing with those who don't yet know Christ. And uh, this reaching out, this sharing our faith, you know, the old word is evangelism, and I can't help but think of Billy Graham was one of the best, who we just lost a couple of weeks ago. But that's what his whole life is about. But there's different ways to approach those, and I call them pre-churched. That's what I'm calling them, pre-churched. It's just they haven't discovered God's church yet, but, but those who are not yet active in the faith. But I really do like Paul's approach, and I need you to hear this. If you don't hear anything else today, hear this when it comes to dealing with others who are not a part of the church yet or, or don't speak uh, like they're a part of the faith. Paul began, here's what I want you to hear, Paul began where people were in their thinking, not where they weren't. Do you understand that? This is so important because we so often expect people, well, why aren't you where I'm at? Why don't you think like I do? You know, why, why aren't you, you know, up on things like I am and in the church? And so, you know, and it frustrates us. And we get, but here's what Paul, he began where they were in their thinking, not where they were not, not where they weren't. And we just have to remember that. God can use us if we're willing to start right where we're at. Paul did that in Athens. Need I remind you? He had quite an audience there, didn't he? And Athens, folks, was not a one-horse town. Can I say it that way? Athens, even in Paul's day, was a huge city. And he had the privilege of speaking before what? The city council. There was not many more important places in that, you know, more important places in that community than there to speak. And Paul got that privilege because he, he paid attention, didn't he? He paid attention. He was attentive and he connected uh, with, with the, the uh, uh, culture there. And so be attentive. The second thing Paul would tell us is this. He would automatically be positive. Quit being negative. That's the way the world is. They're negative about everything. Be positive. Be attentive and then do something positive like Paul did. In a very positive way so as not to turn people off before you have a chance to speak to them or to share your life with them. So Paul used words and ideas here, folks, that were part of their vocabulary. And he used this as a platform for the gospel. But he was positive. Remember this, and this is our goal this week. We've tried to have a goal each week. Last week, we, we uh, uh, were wall builders, and this week, we're bridge builders. So we're trying to build a, build a bridge to culture, and this is one way we can be a survivor in this world. Um, I'm second career pastor, for those of you who don't know me. And uh, what I did for about 15 years before going back to school and going to the ministry, and then that's what I did to support my family while I was in school too, but I was in the Air Express industry, uh, transportation, so anything that would go on a plane and fly somewhere, you know, package or whatever, that's, and, and I, I always tell people I work for everybody but Federal Express, but I work for all the other companies, it seems like, uh, but that's what, uh, uh, you know, provided for my family the first decade that we were married and, and into my schooling and so forth, and 
One time I was at an office in Oshkosh, and, and uh, I was managing that office uh, for the company I was working for, and so I got in on the hiring and firing of uh, and personnel work of, of that particular office, and we needed to hire a sales rep. And so um, we advertised in the local papers, whatever. We got all these applications in. I don't know if anybody's ever been in this position before. How in the world do you sort through all these applications, find the right applicant, you know, and then hire the right person? And uh, we, we did eventually, I'll tell you that right now. You know, we, we got a good sales rep out of that. But how in the world was I going to do this so that I could really communicate with these people who would come in? Because they were people of all different ages and backgrounds and so forth. And I finally made two piles on my desk. There, there was a BB pile, BB, and then there was an AB pile, AB. Oh, you've already got it up there. I was going to tell you what that meant, but now you know. And some of you are looking at me like I'm half nuts. What are you talking about? Well, the picture doesn't really do it justice, but here's the, here's the deal. I, I put it into their birth dates. Were they born before the Beatles arrived, you know, and hit the Ud Sullivan show here, or were they born after that? Because I knew that if they were born before or after at that time in the late 70s, I would have to talk to them differently. They, they would speak a different language. It was two different generations that I was going to have to talk to at least. And so it may seem silly, but that was my point. I was trying to find common ground and find a way where I could connect to these folks. And, and the good news is I eventually did, and we hired a good sales rep and so forth. But folks, Paul could have taken a different approach here. He could have taken a totally different approach. He could have got upset and went, these people just don't understand anything. And he could have been a bit haughty and so forth. He could have said, like, like I so often hear people say, if people don't agree with them, you know, to heck with these people. They don't see it my way, and I don't need them anyway. And that's their attitude. But that's not the attitude Paul took, did he? He took a very positive attitude, looking for common ground. And I believe that uh, we shouldn't take that attitude either. We should do the same as Paul. So when we have an opportunity to wait in the life, let's begin to observe the world around us. Let's begin to observe the language and the ways of those who do not think like we do, maybe or do not understand uh, what we're trying to share with them. But let's also be positive. Let's be positive in our approach um, so as not to turn them off, but to be able to have the conversation. Boy, if there's anything needed in this world today, it's to have a conversation, isn't it? Without people being upset, and without people going at each other's throats before they talk. And, and uh, this is what Paul was modeling to us. And finally, he would tell us this, be bold, be bold. Remember the last couple of weeks I've been talking about, uh, you know, what we do to be survivors, but don't think there's not going to be opposition. When you begin to do things God's way, you're going to have some worldly opposition to that. And the same is true even for bridge builders. But folks, I want to encourage you today, as Paul discovered, as he discovered, some will come to believe just because you've shared your life with them. Others will come to believe. Some will come to know eternal salvation because we've not been afraid of the R word, religion, or the J word, Jesus, or the G word, God. Paul wasn't afraid of those words. He was willing to talk to anybody about his faith at any time. So I spoke briefly last week about the opposition, and folks, I'm here to tell you that Paul had the opposition too. We didn't read that whole section in what Paul experienced there in Athens but uh, verse 18, the teachers of Athens basically called Paul ignorant. He was one of the most educated men in the known world at that time. We know that now. They didn't know that. But because of what he was saying and they didn't understand it, they just thought he was stupid. And so they, they pretty much told him that. And, and then verse 32, others made fun of Paul. They were about ready to throw him out, I think, you know, uh, bodily. And so he had this opposition. But we can't be afraid of others' words Folks, we can't be afraid of others' words who just don't understand yet what the gospel is all about. We have the good news. We just need to find that common ground so that we can have the conversation and share that with folks. We need to have the attitude like Paul that goes something like this. With God's help, with God's help, I'm going to find a way to reach those people because I know God loves them too. And we want them to be with us with God forever. And there's one way that that happens. Folks, Paul was more than a survivor when it came to influencing others for Jesus. He learned to build bridges and find common ground, something to be applauded. And we need to do the same. I don't know how many of you walked in here today. Some of you who are here for the baptism, you walked in, your eyes are on the kids, you know, that's what the day's all about. 
But those of you who are maybe regular attenders, did you notice anything different in the front of the sanctuary today? Some of you didn't because I'm over here and it's over there. But there's a coat tree over there on the other side of the lectern. Anybody notice that? What in the world is that there for? Did Jason forget to put that away? Maybe that's what it was, you know? No, in fact, it's there on purpose. And it has some T-shirts hanging on it. And I've got to tell you a quick story and then I'm done. Several years ago now, I read a one-page editorial in a Christian pastor's magazine, and the editorial was entitled this. It was the evangelistic power of a Fender t-shirt. If I say Fender, I'm a guitar player, so I know what a Fender is. Anybody else know what a Fender is? It's a type of guitar, right? There's Gibsons, there's Fenders, there's two majors in the United States. But the evangelistic power of a Fender t-shirt. And when I read this article, I was a youth pastor down in Janesville. I'd been down there for, you know, I was down there for three years, and I read this article toward the end of my time there, but um, in the 80s when we were there, I got caught up in something that all youth pastors did. Um, you were supposed to get your youth to wear Christian t-shirts. Christian t-shirts were the big thing. And we even sold Christian t-shirts for fundraisers and so forth. And I thought, this is a great way to get their faith shared with their friends, you know, thinking they might wear them to school or something. What I soon found out was this. Those Christian t-shirts, the only people that would wear them were Christians, and the only place they would wear them was church. That was it. Didn't do much good for sharing the faith, did it? And then I read this article that talked about finding common ground. And it was a youth pastor who wrote this article, and he said, you know, I've tried these other things, these other shirts and so forth, but he said, I have more conversations with people about Christ because I'm a guitar player and I'm wearing a Fender t-shirt than I ever would wearing one of those other shirts. And I thought to myself, that is a wonderful way to have common ground. And this is what I've found over the years. All I'm telling you is find that common ground. Who is that person in your life who does not yet know Christ who needs to? They need to have something positive going in their lives. They need to learn to be more than survivors too. And we can help with that. We have the way to do that. And God's word teaches us. But I'm telling you, and Jane hates it when I say this, but my, my collection of t-shirts keeps growing. But I've got guitar t-shirts because that's one of my interests. I also have fly fishing t-shirts because that's another one of my interests. But I have more conversations with people because I wear those t-shirts than I ever did wearing those Christian t-shirts. So folks, use the culture you're in. Find some common ground to have this conversation with others who need to come to know Christ. In that way, we will be more than survivors and we will be bridge builders, just like Paul. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you so much for this day and thank you for Paul and for his word to us today and thank you just for this positive word that he tells us to be, a, be attentive and, and uh, Lord God, uh, just, just to uh, uh, be aware of what's going on around us, to find that common ground and then to, to be bold. And uh, Lord, we need all these things if we're to be more than survivors, um, if we're to live this faith like you've asked us to live it. We want to be your followers. We also want to be your church here at Trinity. So give us the strength, give us your wisdom to do exactly what Paul is modeling today. Help us not to get so upset at the world around us because they don't see things the way they do or, or do things the way we think they should. Just help us to find that common ground. As we're waiting, Lord God, help us to ask you for opportunities to share our faith too. Thank you for this day and for this message. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.